there are many people going through things. And the reason why that is, is when the word goes out, the enemy would, would recognize what's happening, and he will buffet that. He'll raise up his, 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 his imps, if I could put it this way, and he'll say, oh, so you think you're going to change and you're going to grow, and I'm going to sit back and let this happen. Because he's watched your patterns before on the times you tried to change, and when he raised himself up in those times, you've stopped your change, and it worked for his case. But we're not going to allow him to work at this time. We're not going to slow down, and we're not going to stop, and we're not going to turn back. We're going to keep moving forward in the name of Jesus. And once you've made your case to him, listen, I am not slowing down. I am not going to stop. I am not going backwards, but I'm going forwards in the name of Jesus. And no matter what you raise against me, you're not stopping me. You're going to find that he is going to quickly backtrack because he is tired of getting beaten down. He doesn't like it. He would like to isolate you. And for me as a pastor and for the years that I've served in ministry and as a Christian, I've watched some incredible things that have happened. Maybe I'll not get to my message. Some incredible things that have happened in the last two weeks. Last week we had like the skeleton crew here. (laughs) We did. We had a skeleton crew here. And it looked like people came in with bruises and they were battered and they were they were just going through it like a tough time. And and as and from living for God for almost 35 years now, I've watched the patterns of things from being in ministry almost 25 years. 20, I'm not gonna count. From that amount of time, I've watched the patterns. And when you begin to have this, this, this momentum shift, the enemy says, I don't think so. And a good church body, a good healthy church body, there's signs to look for. And it doesn't mean a good healthy church body is where it needs to be. It doesn't mean a good healthy church body is, is a church body that is completely mature But a good, healthy church body does the things that are necessary to continue in the process of growth. Does that make sense? And so in the last couple of weeks, some people have opened up and said, hey, pastor or Sister Patterson or other saint, I've been going through this and this is what's happening and, and, and I feel out of place, but this is what's happening in my life. And you know what I'm saying? In their minds, they're going, they're going, man, I hate to bring, I hate to bring up and put a burden on them. I hate to say this and I hate to say that. Because then the enemy is saying, stay isolated, don't bring it up, don't talk about it, allow yourself to, you're just don't even bring it up. You're gonna bother the pastor, you're gonna bother the brothers, you're gonna bother the sisters, don't even say anything. Why? Because if he can keep you isolated, he'll dry you out spiritually and cause you to die of starvation and thirst. But You have said, I need help. (laughs) And you say, hey, I've got a trouble. I've got a trial. And then we link arms together. We say, let's pray together. We we link arms together. And the revelation of saints, they say, wow, they didn't shoot me down. They didn't judge me. They didn't come against me. They didn't didn't cause me to feel like I'm less of a person. They didn't make me feel like I'm, I'm dirt. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? They actually supported me, and they loved me through it, and they cared for me through it, and they said, how can I help? And and the enemy's going, no! So I want to commend you for not closing your mouth because the enemy would want you to stay silent. And I also commend this body for being spiritual enough not to take advantage of people's weaknesses. But to bear one another's burdens, and by that we fulfill the law of Christ. To say, you know what? We can make it through this. We're going to make it to the other side. We're going to fulfill what God is saying. You can make it. We can make it. We've got, a, we've got a goal. There's a place that we're going together. And by the way, that's the title of my message. You can make it. You can make it. Can you put that slide up, sister? You, you're going to make it. You can make it. 
You need to look at your neighbor and say, you can make it. Look at somebody beside you. Look at someone else and say, you can make it. You, you need to realize, when you, when you get your mind made up and you say you're moving forward, understand you will be buffeted. The enemy cannot stand it when you make a decision to live for God. The enemy cannot stand it when you live for God and you decide to be more fervent for God. He cannot stand it when you make up your mind to be convicted in God. He cannot stand it when you draw lines in your spirituality in God. Because he sees the levels of change in your life. And those levels of change cause there to be levels of consecration. And levels of consecration mean there's levels of anointing that change in your life. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And those levels of anointing come at a cost. But you have to realize that cost is very little. It's big at the moment, but it's very little compared to where God is taking you. <laughs> the cross was a big deal, but the grave and the resurrection caused us to be here. And if we can realize the small things that we go through are just another step into the reality of where he's taking this body and the miracles that he wants to use you in, then Jesus, allow me to have the guts, the intestinal fortitude to say, Jesus, I can make it. I can do it. And he will not let you go through it alone. When you're battling in the midst of the trouble, know that he's with you. And I'm telling you, if you can just, if you can learn some valuable lessons from the, the dumb mistakes I've made over the years, don't be afraid to turn to people that are spiritual in your life and say, can you help me? And when you do that, realize not that you're looking at the man or the woman, you're looking at the God behind them. Because you're fulfilling the word of God. Look at somebody nearby and say, you're on my team. We're on the same team. If we can ever identify in the, and I say this, this church has been here a long time, but I'm talking about in the young years of the revival that God's bringing us into. If we can recognize and learn who our team members are, when an imposter comes in, we will not be fooled. We will not be wowed into believing the imposter. John chapter 16, verse 33. Now I'm going to go into the scripture. Like I said, we're never going to get into where I'm going. We're just going to do the best we can with the time we've got it. I've got the Living Bible. I'm sorry, I do cross translations. Most of it's going to be in the King James, but I do use a couple others uh, just, to, just to get my point across. Jesus says this, I have told you all this so that you will have peace of heart and mind. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Isn't that exciting? I was on the phone with my son-in-law this week, and I, I'll tell you what, I, I love to watch people grow. <laughs> I'm on the phone with him, and he's like, you know what, I'm starting to realize that people are drawing this picture of Christianity being easy, but it's not easy. You're going to have trouble. And I'm like... He's getting it. It's not easy to live for God. If you want to be a real man or a real woman, and I'm saying it, yes, there are two distinctions. If you want to be a real man and a real woman, live for God. He says, you're going to have many trials and sorrows, but cheer up. 
Isn't that awesome? For I have overcome the world. If your investment is in Jesus, your hope is not in the trials and the sorrows of this world, but in Jesus. He is the overcomer of everything you could have hoped for in this world. Look at your neighbor say, you can make it. If you have the mindset you're going to be disappointed in life, then you can handle the disappointments that come your way. But if you have the understanding that you can cheer up because you'll never be disappointed in Jesus, you got your hope in the right place. Let's pray. God, we love you today. Let your word have its place in our hearts. Speak to us today. Give us wisdom and understanding. Let the spirit of revelation be upon us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to endure our hardships as a true soldier. Help us, Lord, to see that you have true hope, Lord. You have overcome this world. Help us to leave with cheer in our hearts to realize that you are on our sides and that we're going to make it, God. We rebuke every spirit that opposes yours. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. We take dominion over them and we pray and plead your blood in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Don't you love it when the Lord puts that plain as day in Scripture? You're going to have trouble. You see, what we love to do is we like to to, to spot run through all of the great messages online of how everything is supposed to be evangelistically correct. Everything's going to be perfect in life. I'm not trying to offend anybody. Everybody's going to have a miracle. Everybody's going to be healed. Every, everybody's going to have every provided need. This is, this is the age that we live in. And we don't realize that these people preaching this go through trials themselves. You're catching that moment. Peter and John approached the gate beautiful, and that man was laid at that gate for years. That means that very likely Jesus passed that same gate praying. Because it's the same temple that they prayed at. So God has perfect timing. But what we catch is silver and gold, have I none? God did a miracle. And we forget all the preceding years and we just look at the moment. That's kind of like when we go cruise through Facebook and YouTube and everything else. It's kind of like when we go to general conference or we go to, because of the times, or we go through all those messages and we're like, wow. And then I had this preacher friend of mine in Pennsylvania. He said, I'm not going to because of the times anymore. I said, why? He said, because every time I come back, I come back pumped and something bad happens. I'm like, well, that's not the reason you go there. He said, yeah, I just fell off a roof of a two-story building, broke my hip and my leg in three places. I said, well, you didn't go there so that you wouldn't have trouble. You went there for your spirit. Doesn't matter. I'm not going there anymore. Because when I come back, half my church leaves when I come back, or, or, I, or I have an accident, or something happens. In this world, you're going to have trouble. Doesn't mean God's any less of a miracle worker. It doesn't mean that we will not have trials. He said we will have trials. Doesn't mean we won't have seasons. He's promised we'll have seasons. <laughs> we have seasons every year. We have seasons throughout our lifetime. I love my children, but I'm glad they're still not living with us. I'm glad they had children and that their children aren't living with us. Now, I love them. I love them for vacation. I love when they come. I take my hearing aids out most of the time. But there's a reason. It's not a lack of loving them. It's because we have different seasons. Are are we understanding? God, God worked into mankind's seasons. He even worked into six days working in the seventh day of rest. He knows how we operate. He knows how we're created to be. 
And so we've got to, in order to be successful as Christians, we have to look at the patterns, the seasons, the days, and understand that's just how he operates. And when Jesus says, in this world or in this life, you will have trials and you're going to have trouble, it's not when you look at that and you say, well, yes, we will. That does not mean you're less spiritual for recognizing that. And today's spiritual generation makes it look like you're being less spiritual because you recognize that. No, actually, you are more understanding of your spirituality. Because I thank God every time he's given me a miracle, every time he's provided for me, every time he's done something and gone above and beyond, and he has. And I thank God, here's where maturity comes in, for the times when he didn't do it. And the time that I didn't see the provision. And the time that I didn't see the healing. Oh, because he was working something else in me. You, you're not, I don't know if you're getting it. Because we want everything now. And if we don't get everything now, God, you're less than who you say you are. We, we don't say that, but we say that. God, if you don't do it right now, God, I want it now. And then when he does it now, we've failed to learn the lesson of trials and troubles in life. Because trials and trouble build maturity. They build appreciation. <laughs> oh, I better get back on my lesson. <sighs> Lord, help me. This is why I'm scatterbrained when I'm studying. Are you ready? Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. Look at your neighbor and say, I know. Are you ready? We know all things work together for the good of them that love God. Do you love God today? To them that are the called according to his purpose. Are you called according to God's purpose? then you know that all things work together. It doesn't say that all things are good. It says they all work together for the good. I look at it as the very first assembly line that Ford put together. He's the very first one who started the assembly line process with the early Fords. And, and what they do is they start off and they have a frame and they have certain things that they put together and they add on and it goes down the line. And it's used very commonly now today, the assembly line. And they put the car together in pieces and the engine together in pieces and, the, and down the line it becomes something. But when you look at the beginning of a car, you're like, I ain't driving that because it's not a car. And what we do in life is we look at the moment rather than the finish. Everything's working together for the good. But in the moment, it doesn't feel good. I don't, I don't think we're getting it. <laughs> you love God and you're called according to his purpose. You have to understand that there is a principle of process in this scripture. It doesn't say that all things are good. It says they work together. They're, they're working together. Every process in your walk with God is working together. Every trial is working with the triumph. Every trouble is working with the good. Every, every, every provision is working with what seems to be a need. Every hurt is working with a healing. How would you know what a healing is if you didn't have a hurt? How would you know what a provision is if you didn't have a need? Everything's working together. So at the end of it, you're looking back, you're, wow, that is good. Every day of creation took a day to create. And at the end, God said, oh, that's good. But he didn't say it was good until the end of that day. And of course, at the end, he goes, now that's really good. That's very good. So let's look at these three principles of this scripture. First, we know. I want to ask you this. You need to get this in your head. Do you know? 
Because the scripture is saying we know. You have to get this in your brain. Do you know? We know that all things work together for good. When you're going through a trouble, you need to remind yourself that all things work together for good. When the trouble happens in your life, you need to say to yourself, God, I know all things work together for good. God, I know all things are working together right now. When my pastor from Pennsylvania had that widow maker come out of the top of the tree, nearly killed him, nearly took his life, the doctor said one millimeter difference, it would have killed you, you or you would have been paralyzed. He's been through multiple surgeries. He said, I'd never have accused God of wrong in this situation. I never falsely accused God. But when that happened, I went to the, I went to the sanctuary and I prayed. I said, God, you know what's going on. All things work together for good. I don't know why this happened. I don't understand the purpose of it. I don't know why you're bringing this to pass. When things are happening, you've got to remind yourself in prayer, God, all things work together for the good. All things work together for the good. You've got everything in process, Lord. I can't look at this moment and just get polarized on this moment. Everything's coming together. This is just one moment of an entire process. So that's good news. In other words, your problems aren't going to be forever. You've got to change the way you think. Your situation in that moment isn't final. In other words, God is with you. He hasn't left you high and dry. 1 John 1 and 9, if you've done it because of yourself, in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Another promise in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 3, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. You're in the middle of the process. God is well able to protect you. Don't give up because of the current situation. Trust in God. If you're in the trial, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, for there hath no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted or tried, that word is in the original language, above that year able, but will with that trial or temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, every trial that comes your way, God says, I've already designed a way for you to be able to handle it. This is not bigger than you. And it's definitely not bigger than me. You better stay by my side. You better stay with me. I'll be able to help you through it. Don't give up. Are you hear me? God's telling you, don't give up. This trial, that everybody's going through these trials. It's not bigger than everybody else's trial they've been through in life. I know that I can, you just got to trust in me. God's trying to tell you, don't, don't, don't give up through this. So what is it continue, contingent on? What is this whole contingency factor? And we know all things work together. Everything works together. It's all contingent on the fact of them that love God. Does anybody love God here today? Do you love God? If you love God, everything's going to be okay. If you love God, everything's going to be okay. You know, when everything goes haywire in your life, you got to get back into the place of where you're loving him. It's okay for you to be honest, say, God, I don't understand, but I still love you. God, I don't know why, but I still love you. God, I don't... When you're blindsided, God already knows what's going on. He already saw it coming. First John 3 and 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let your love... Be shown by your actions. James 4, 6 through 8, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. 
Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You have to submit yourself to God before you have the power to resist Satan. Everybody's like, resist the devil, resist the devil. Well, what about submitting yourself to God? You can't just sit there and say, oh, you just got to resist the devil. No, you have to make sure you're committed and submitted to God so that when you resist the devil, you're not having an all-night prayer meeting against him. <laughs> you say, well, that's, that's impossible. No, I watch people. I've seen people over the years. They spend all their prayer meeting fighting Satan instead of submitting to God. <laughs> Had this one lady I was praying for. She was possessed in our church in North Platte. And, uh, and she was praying, and everybody was praying, and I said, okay, come back when you want delivered. Everybody thought I was just being rude. I said, when you're ready to be delivered, come back. A month later, she came back, and she was leaning over the back pew, and she said, uh, I said, are you ready to be delivered? She said, yeah, I've been tormented for the whole month. And she was delivered, what, in just a few minutes? Hey, you, you don't understand. We, we're, not, we're not having a devil circus around here. When people want delivered, they get delivered. Right. Right. Some people want to have this big show like, oh, I got power. Ugh. No. If people want delivered from Satan, we're not having a show. If they want to have this thing, if people don't want to be delivered, don't spend your whole mind and life fighting a devil that people don't want to be delivered from. It's not about your power. It's about their willingness, not unwillingness to submit to God. And, and it, we know from the scripture that a man with a legion of devils, still those devils could not stop him from running to the feet of Jesus and bowing himself. So that devil, even a legion of devils don't have the power to, to stop someone who wants to submit themselves to God. You know, and, and I know that, sorry, I came out of non-church background. I used to be into all the satanic movies, even Anton LaVey and all that other stuff. Some of you are like, who is that? Don't even worry about it. I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm just telling you, you have to realize I came out of all that stuff. I used to watch it. I used to learn it. I used to do all, I'm just, all that's glorified in satanic movies of the power all the way down to even uh, all the way down to the satanic movies of priest wrestling. That's, you know, I'm not trying to offend anybody. That's the reason why satanic movies choose priests because they don't have power. Because they couldn't make a two hour movie out of apostolics, it'd be a two minute movie. In Jesus' name telling you what we've got the authority in Jesus name we've got the authority in Jesus name <laughs> so I watched all that stuff and they make it all the spirit of fear is strong you could be sitting on a couch with a couch against the back wall of your house and still be looking over your shoulder because that's the spirit of fear and that's why I would tell you I don't know this is just all free stuff by the way brother I don't know you don't, need to be, you don't need to be dabbling in that stuff. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Power and love and a sound mind. And if you're dealing with that spirit of fear, it might be by, because you have been entertaining yourself with things that take away love, power, and a sound mind. Are you telling me not to watch my satanic movie? You can do whatever you want, but I want to live in peace, and I want to live in the power of God. You can do whatever you want. I chose years ago. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not dabbling in that stuff anymore. I, don't, I won't even go into the books. I won't even go into the games. I won't even go into all that stuff. Why? I needed to be free. I needed to be victorious. I needed to live the way that I said that I was, in a way that I walk and live in authority in the name of Jesus. Because I don't want anybody to walk into this building and walk back out and say, well, that church is hypocritical. I didn't even get free. Because they didn't have power. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah, help me. Getting sidetracked. 
Notice what he says. He says, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You want God to minister to you? You need to start getting close to him. And cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. You need to get single-minded for Jesus. You wonder where your struggle's coming from because you have not gotten your mind where it needs to go. Hmm. I'm not going to get where I need to go. I need to start wrapping it up already. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 28. To those that are the called according to his purpose. Romans 1, 5, and 6 says, By whom ye receive grace and apostleship for the obedience of the faith to all nations for his name, amongst, among whom ye are also called the called of Jesus Christ. You notice, have you ever noticed in that Romans 8, 28, it says, uh, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not called according to his purpose. The called. In other words, it is a place. It, it is a person or a position of, uh, of authority. It is that we are going to see all things work together to those that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Romans 1, 5, and 6 says, among whom ye also are the called of Jesus Christ. In other words, it is the position of who you are in God. And I think that the scripture is truly amazing. There's a common mistake that people use when they divide it. They just read it for what it is rather than what just one says, kind of like what we studied recently when we talked about the Scripture, when we say rightly dividing the word of truth. Most people just read Old and New Testament like we talked about recently in our Bible studies. But we have to realize that the Bible is subdivided on purpose so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. There's the gospel, the acts, the epistles, and the revelations. And we, we've talked about this recently, so I won't spend much time in it. But when you're trying to find salvation, don't go to the epistles. These are written to save people. Romans through Jude is written to people that have already experienced salvation in the book of Acts. So when you're reading the book of Old Romans and it says the called, these are people that have already been born again. So in Romans 1, Paul is addressing the saints at Rome, but when he gets to his audience in verse 7, he says they are the called, the beloved. And when he look at Thessalonians 1, he talks to them 20 years after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and he says they are the called by their gospel. When you look in 1 Corinthians, it says that they are the people of the gospel, that they are the ordained. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. And so we know that the scripture says in order to be born again, we are to be born again of water and of spirit. I'm going quickly because we've been through this recently. And we understand that Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and of spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. And in Acts chapter 2 and 38, Peter said unto them, this is the first time preaching happened at the establishment of the church, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the washing away of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that's water and spirit, for the promise or the promise of salvation is to you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, as he's still calling people today. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Who are the called? It's the people that have been born again not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. First Thessalonians 4 and 7, For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Are you hearing? We're a part of the called. We're a part of the church. We're a part of this family. Yes, amen, amen. This is the family of God. We are the called according 
to God's calling. Let me wrap this up. I'm just going to skip a thousand scriptures that I should never put in here. I'm just like, wow. Is everybody okay today? Yes. Romans 8, 28. Throw that back up there, sister. I'm just going to go to the crux of everything that I've been talking about. Sister Sahaley, can you go out into the back seat of my car and grab a uh, football? Never heard that when somebody's preaching, have you? Welcome to my world. It's okay. Probably never saw that either. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for them, for the good of, to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 31, notice this. What shall we say to these things? If God before us, everyone say us. You can keep it up there, sis. Thank you. If God be for us, who can be against us? Say us. us. You got to realize we have not talked about I or me. Now we're getting into personal pronouns. We're talking about King James Version pronouns. The body of Christ is so necessary. The final key of this is us. We are not an island unto ourselves. We are not God's superhero working on our own. We are not a secret agent for the kingdom of God because there are no such things. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. We are the assembly. We are the ecclesia. We are the community. We are the flock. We are God's family. And God throughout his word is clear that the church is to work together as an us and not as a me or an I. Because we need one another. I've heard throughout COVID and all the things in the last probably 10 years, it's become very, very uh, prevalent to hear things like, well, I don't need to go to church. I can just get it at home now. I got my internet. Yeah, and you're also getting porn off the internet too. And you're also getting your, your, uh, all your entertainment off the internet too. And then, then you're also filling yourself with all the garbage news off the internet. And you're also... I'm sorry, getting pretty straightforward here. Getting all your, all, your, all your stupid stuff that you're getting involved in on the internet. There's something about what we're doing here right now that's different. There's something amazing about this here. Because before there ever was internet, there was the Bible. And God knows what it means to gather together. There's just something about it. 58 times in the Bible, it uses the phrase one another. It says to love one another, to care for one another, to greet one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to counsel one another, share with one another, help one another. All these are mutual ministry of the body of Christ to itself. All of us to one another. If God be for us, who can be against us? I don't know. Can I just go common sense to you? I don't know how many times in the past years that I've been living for God where I've decided that, man, I just, man, I just don't feel good. I don't want to go to church. I'll, I'll watch it online, and I watch everybody else get blessed. I'm like, man, I wish I would have went to church. If we're honest with ourselves, man, I wish I was there. Or, you, man, that was a great service. I loved it. Man, I wish you were here. And you're like, oh, yeah, I got to watch it online. You know what you're doing? You're just helping your conscience because you know you wish you were there. It's just the next best thing to be in there, which isn't really the next best thing because you weren't there. And then people use the cop out. I was there in spirit. No, you weren't. You were at home. Your spirit's in your body. Goofball. What is wrong with you?
If we, if God be for us, who can be against us? If we be against us, how can God work through us? We need unity of the body of Christ. Where God is taking this church, we must grow spiritually and in unity. The Bible uses the church 80 times in the, in the New Testament alone. Only four times does it refer of those 80 times to the church worldwide. Every other time, it talks about the local church. So this local assembly is actually being talked about biblically 76 times in the New Testament is being referred to that, that dynamic of the church. So there are more than 30 commands in the New Testament that you cannot obey unless you're a faithful member of a local church. I'm combating mentalities. That's all I'm doing right now. You need to be in the house of God with people of like precious faith. Whether it's this church or another church, you just need to be in a church assembly that you know that they're preaching the truth and, they're, and, and you're on the same faith level trying to grow. There's something about accountability. Hmm. I close with Psalms 133, and I'm going to use the W-E-B, the World Evangelism Bible, I guess is what it's called. I just thought it was pretty interesting how they used it. It's a study Bible. <clears throat> it says this, see how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to, do it, to live together in unity. So it's pretty close to the other one, but it says, it's like the precious oil on the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that came down on the edge of his robes. And you think, well, what in the world, God, are you talking about? Unity and Aaron's beard and robe and oil. It's the anointing oil. This is what the, the, this version of the Bible has for notes. It's a special and costly anointing oil that was used by Moses to anoint Aaron and the first high priest of Israel in Exodus 29 and to dedicate all the priests to God's service. The oil was extremely fragrant, setting the priests apart for their work in the service of God's people. Brotherly harmony amongst God's people, like anointing oil, gives off a sweet fragrance to all who watch it and demonstrates that we are set apart to serve God. So the anointing of unity sets off a fragrance. People can tell when the body is in unity. He says then, like verse 3, like the dew of Hermon that comes down from the hills of Zion, where Yahweh, or where God, gives the blessing, even life forevermore. In the King James Version, it says, God commands the blessing. When people get unified, this is the only place you'll find in the Bible where God commands blessing. Isn't that interesting? He just says, when you get unity, you actually... God says, bless. That's why unity is so hard to attain. That's why Satan is so good at trying to cause disunity. That's why Satan caused disunity in the garden and then sin went abounding and started sin in the bloodline of man from that point on and caused a whole problem for all of humanity. Disunity. If we can understand that us together in unity, even the Hispanic church that's going to be starting here in the end of the month, we are going to see God. Even the language barrier doesn't change the mission. It enhances the mission to see the word of God go into this community. You say, why the football then? Because I want a commanded blessing. I want a commanded blessing. My, my, I was born in Philadelphia. Don't hold that against me. If you go back there now, you might go down to see where the Declaration of Independence and the, and the place where it's all like the historical area. That's great. Once you get out of there, it, my dad called it filthy Delphia because it's very, very old and filthy. My football team's doing good this year, though. That doesn't mean it won't change by tomorrow and next year. But I'm not talking about that team. I'm talking about our team. 
In order to operate as a team, we have to let down our guard and work together. Can you catch? No. <laughs> I was concerned about that. I, I was con- Can you catch? Can I throw? That's the question. You might want to step away from the lamps. Can you step out, Brother Roger? Away from these chandeliers? Now, kids, you can't do this in church. Brother? There you go. Now, I am so glad. I am so glad my brother can catch. You know why? He put up his hands to receive. Otherwise, it would have bounced off his chest and hit the ground, and he wouldn't have been doing a good job. He would have played like Nebraska Cornhuskers. Sorry, let me leave out the personal references. <laughs> but here's the thing I want you to understand. In order for throwing and receiving, it takes us to make some effort. When we want the Holy Ghost, we don't get it like this. We want blessings, we don't get it like this. When we want God to move, we don't get it like this. We don't work against one another to see revival. We work together to see revival. We set ourselves in the position of allowing ourselves to see the, the, the thing that we're seeing come to pass, come to pass. When I, when I threw that to Brother Sunaga, I'm thankful that he went like this. You know why? That tells me that he is mechanically inclined to receive. He knows what to do to receive. <laughs> now, if he'd have been like this and just bounced off him, like, man, I got to pray for you, dude. You don't even know what you're doing. But you know what? We expect God to be that way with us. <laughs> well, God, you should have caught it for me. No, he made you a certain way. He made you to lift your hands in the sanctuary. He made you to clap your hands in the sanctuary. He made you to sing a song in the sanctuary. He made you to lift your voice and shout unto him a, a shout of praise in the sanctuary. He made you so that you can pray and give your, 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 your voice to him and to magnify him. And you've got all the scripture to show it and you're waiting for him to do it for you and he's been throwing the ball to you and you've just been standing there like a dummy. Is that clear enough? Sorry if I'm offending you. <laughs> but that's how I take it. God does that to me. I don't know how many times God's thrown a ball to me and I've just like, <laughs> God, throw me a ball. And he's like, I just did it to you, dummy. I just tried to throw it to you. And you're sitting there saying, well, throw me the ball. Can you throw it back to me, brother? That means, thank you. I palm that, by the way. I'm not as, I got bifocals now. It's just, <laughs> can you catch? Whoa! You, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to teach you something. Now, let, let me... Brother Cole, I used you a couple weeks ago. Let me use you again, because that way you feel used. Come on up here. How, how, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I would rather be working with my brother than against my brother. Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. I want him to have my back and I want to have his back. Remember Red Rover, Red Rover, come on over? Is that how it said it? I used to love that game. Because I used to just plow through the weakest link of the other line. <laughs> Don't th- I wasn't the man. I was like, I was, I was terrible. Find the smallest girl in that line and tear through. <laughs> I'm like, good job. But I, I, wanna f- I want us to be in a position where the enemy, yes. Yes. if someone drives into our driveway, remember what I said earlier, there is a, 
It doesn't matter if they have a legion, if they're coming to the feet of Jesus. When they pull into this driveway and they walk through those doors, or the new doors, I'm being prophetic, that when they walk through those doors and they need Jesus, that they see this body of believers this strong. They don't see this body like this. We're just, we're just in the same church, but we can't stand each other. You, you, it sounds stupid, but it's true. We do that. We've got to be unified rather than just putting up with each other. And let me make sure that I dispel something. It doesn't mean we have to be best friends. Every one of us don't have to be best friends. It means we have to depend on one another. When I was in the Air Force, we used to be able to have, we used to know that if, if the person next to, back, back in the day was carrying an M16 next to you, you could trust that they weren't being in a position to shoot you in the back. That, that you could count on them. To, they've got your back and you've got their back. They use M16s anymore? I don't know. M4, good for you. Um, <laughs> the reality is, is that even if, even if the, my, my, my fellow airmen, I didn't know them that well. I knew that I could trust them. And I didn't know what their likes were. I didn't have all the same likes. I didn't have all the same dislikes. I didn't have to know all their personal things. I just had to know that if we got into battle, I could trust them. I had to know that we're on the same team. And as we enter into this future of this church, whether it's going to be New Life, Rapid City, or New Life, Blackhawk, or New Life, Hot Springs, or whatever it's going to end up being in the future in the divisions of New Life. It's not a divided church, but even when we're apart, we're still a part of the same body. We're working toward the same goal. So that means when I'm sitting at my kitchen table with you, Brother Ryan, he doesn't have to worry about you and I talking. And when I'm sitting with you, he doesn't have to worry about you and I talking. Unless we're saying, Brother Ryan, let's pray. He's been going through a trial. Oh, by the way, I'm not talking about his trial. I'm just saying he needs prayer. We're the body of Christ. We're on the same team. And if we're divided, Satan is not scared even if we're carrying the Acts, book of Acts message. He is not scared because if people come in, they're going to be born with defects. But if we can get on the same page in unity, I'm telling you what, we are going to have a problem because the birthing station isn't big enough. Now, I don't know how you feel. I'm, I'm going to hand him the ball. But I'm not going to let him drop the ball. Okay? Because I'm going to be the first one. I want this ball to represent who's here now. And in two years, I want to come back and look at this ball. It'll be in my office Maybe in the new building, it'll be in my office in display. And I want to look back and say, oh, look what God has done. Because this number of people is not what used to be on there. And I want you to sign this ball if you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm on the same team. I want to see God's kingdom go forward. Everything's working together for the good of them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So I'm on that team. I'm one of them. I'm one of them, and I want to be on that team. So I'm just going to put, I'm going to put my title. Okay, is that all right? Because I don't want to take up all the space. But I don't want you signing if you're going to be a backbiter, a tail bearer. I don't want you to sign up if you're going to be one of those guys that are betting against the team. One of you guys that are going to be praying against the team. I, I, I want to see people that are saying, you know what, Pastor, I'm with you. We, we want to see revival. 
There are too many people lost that need Jesus. There are too many people that need to be baptized in Jesus' name. There are too many people that are bound that need to be free. There are too many people that need to be on this team because we need to see the team grow. Yes, amen, amen. Uh, you want to be on the team? Okay, just making sure. I didn't want to coerce him to be on the team. Yeah, made him stand up here the whole time. But if you want to be on the team, come on. Just let him hand the ball to you if you want to be next. Don't make him come to you so you can sit there and take the ball, sister. Come on. No running backs take the ball sitting. I'm telling you what, I'm pumped. I want to see God do incredible things. Let, let, let me tell you something personal. I, I don't have a lot of major medical issues, but I have this medical issue that is not pop, not like a well-known issue, but it's a esophageal issue that causes me, if I'm not on a certain medicine, to if I swallow, my food will get jammed in my esophagus and I can't swallow it. So I've been on a medicine since the late 90s. And if I stop taking that medicine, I'm in horrible shape. Why are you telling me that? Because, Brother Cole, it'd be awesome if Jesus healed me. I want that healing. But you know what? I want to see the heroin dict come in here and get healed first. I want to be healed, but I want to see the alcoholic be freed from alcoholism first. I want to see the person that's in pornography addiction freed from pornography first. I want to see the sinner freed from the sin addiction first. I want to see people freed from, their, from, the, from the things that are keeping them down free first. If i got to take a little medicine to take care of this, that's all right. If God heals me, thank you, Jesus. I'll take the healing. But God, don't heal me if there's still people out there that don't know you. I'll take the discomfort if i got to take it. But Lord, there are too many people that don't know you. There are too many people that don't know him. And the anointing of God is commanded to a body who says, I want to be a part of unity. I want to be a part of the unity of the body. I want to be a part of the unity of the body. I want the anointing oil to flow from the top of this body to the bottom. I want people to walk in here. I'm telling you, I've seen it before. I've, I've, I've seen it before. I've seen people come in the back doors of our church. It was so unified. You've been in North Platte. There was a time when it was so unified when people tried to come in that were false and they couldn't even hardly stay in the church. They had to leave. Yes. But people there were so unified The people that tried to cause division couldn't even handle it. It's almost, it's not, nobody forced them out. They just couldn't feel comfortable being in a place where they were revealed. I didn't have to call them out from the pulpit all the time. I didn't have to try to preach them out of there. Just just the unity was so incredible that someone just like you would walk up and you'd be so nice to them and some conviction would come over their spirit and they just couldn't feel comfortable. They felt dirty in a place where there was unity. I want to be in a place where they'll walk through the doors and the conviction of their sinful lifestyle take them to their knees. Yes. And they'll never even make it to the front of the altar because they need to be clean. They need to be changed. God was dealing with their heart. All things work together. Will the body work together? Do you love God? All things work together. My question in final, is the body going to work together? And if we love God, it will. It will. It will. If you're called according to His purpose, the body will work together.